So welcome, this is Chris Cooney. Uh, welcome to the Metro South Chamber of Commerce January a Good Day Metro South. We're here at Stonehill College at the beautiful Martin Institute. We have a fantastic program that we uh, have put together today for you and uh, includes a uh, new state representative, uh, the dean of the new business school, uh, the main uh, business school here at Stonehill College, as well as uh, the uh, a, a chief economist who has been with uh, the Federal Reserve, but now is with Eastern Bank. Uh, so we've got some terrific uh, speakers. We hope you uh, enjoy uh, the presentation and uh, check us out online if you uh, want uh, to get more information on any of these speakers. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So I'm Rita Mendez, um, your new state representative. So I'm here as part of this great event today as one of the guest speaker, just telling everybody a little bit about my story, a little bit about of how um, we were all able to together create this um, new district in Brockton, which is the um, majority minority district in Brockton and also as part of that new district I was elected as your state representative in the city of Brockton so now we're here we're working hard I ask each and every one of you to start reaching out there's lots of bills that have been filed at the state house and I'm co-sponsoring a lot of these bills there are going to directly benefit our communities the city of Brockton. So if there's anything that you're watching, anything that you want me to be a part of, to co-sponsor, to advocate on your behalf, definitely reach out to me. Definitely let me know. This is in collaboration, partnership, and I'm here to work for you. So it's a pleasure and honor to be here at this event, to be a guest speaker, and it's also an honor to be serving you as your state representative. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys uh, for coming and listening to this uh, presentation of mine. Um, let me just tell you who would be interested in hearing about how connected for business today. If you're a small business owner in the audience, you're probably going to be interested in what I have to say. If you work for a small business here in Massachusetts, you may be interested in what I have to say. If you buy services to a small businesses or small businesses, you'll be interested in what I have to say. If you know a small business, I think you'll be interested in what I have to say. So I'm hoping that everyone in here is going to be very interested in what I'm going to provide information on today. And that is affordable, flexible health coverage for small businesses here in Massachusetts. So I'll try to go through this pretty quickly because I know uh, Jeff's going next. <laughs> um, but we're going to review a little bit about what is the Health Connector? What are some of the employers' experiences shopping through the Health Connector for business? Um, how to get started if everything sounds great to you today? And then also, just to let you know that there is also health insurance um, that's available for sole proprietors, owner-only, family-run businesses also. So what, what is the Health Connector? Um, some of you may be familiar with the Health Connector. Just to let you know, we are the state's health insurance marketplace. And our goal is to provide individuals families and small businesses with affordable health coverage and easy access to it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about like what's available for small businesses with 50 or fewer um, employees in it and also the availability of health insurance plans for individuals who can't get health insurance through their job. Maybe they are an entrepreneur, a sole proprietor, or partnerships. We also have availability for that. And just to let you know, I'm going to say the word health a lot today, but I just want to let you know that we also offer dental insurance on the health connector, okay? But I just use the word health a lot. Um, so just to give you an idea, when we say the word marketplace, what do we really mean? Well, we are kind of like a one-stop shopping solution for small businesses to come to, and that's because we are the only place in Massachusetts that has all the leading carriers in one location. So we're an online portal. When people come to our platform, they get to see plans available from all of these carriers. So I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with at least one or mo most of these logos, maybe all of them. And I just want to let you know that all the plans that go through the Health Connector for Business have been certified through our seal of approval process. And also, it meets all minimum credible coverage to meet state required law for offering health insurance. So let me talk a little bit about Health Connector for Business. That's what I oversee. And Health Connector for Business, just to let you know, is designed for small businesses with 50 or fewer employees 
located in Massachusetts. The business has to be located in Massachusetts. The employees can be wherever. And it is a way to provide affordable, flexible health coverage. So I told you I'd give you a little bit of a background on what we have heard back since we debuted January 1st, 2018 on our members' experience. And these are some of the key benefits that members of um, small businesses who have enrolled through us have pointed out on why they've come to us and why they've stayed with us. First thing, we're a one-stop shopping solution. I already said that. Very easy. You log into our portal, you have access to all the leading insurers in one location. So it makes it very easy for you to shop. Then we've also found that on average, because people can comparison shop between different carriers, different plans, have, and have everything at their fingertips, businesses find that they actually save on average about 20% in comparison to shopping one a carrier to another carrier to another carrier and taking more time out. So um, employers have responded back like that. We also have this great rebate program and it's focused on wellness. So we actually incentivize both the businesses and their employees to take a wellness activity. And we have over here pre-approved. I'll talk a little bit about that. But we actually incentivize and give money back for um, completing a wellness activity. We also have flexible employee choice. Uh, this is very unique to the Health Connector for Business. You can only find this way of offering health insurance at the Health Connector for Business. And the goal of the employee choice model is for to allow for the business to control their costs while providing their employees with choice, choosing the plan that best fits their needs and their family's needs and their financial needs. We also have free certified assistants. We actually have over 500 certified brokers. These are local brokers in your community that are certified with the Health Connector for Business and they are free for you to utilize, for you to get assistance in and advisement of what's the best plan for you and your employees. And as I stated before, just keep in mind that you don't have to go really researching these plans to make sure that they meet their credible coverage because we only approve plans that meet minimum credible coverage on the Health Connector for Business. So I told you that this flexible employee choice model is unique and exclusive to the Health Connector for Business. So I just want to let you know, the way of offering health insurance through the employee choice model, you cannot find these models anywhere else, only on the Health Connector for Business. And our goal when we created these employee choice models, which I'll explain in the next slide, was to allow for an employer to create a budget or a cost control plan, something that the business could afford to pay into, but then give that contribution, that allowance, to the employees and then allow them to choose the plan that fits their needs and they can pay the difference outside of what the business can afford to pay into. And since this is completely online, and I just told you that all the insurers in one location, I don't want you to think this is hard for employees if you offer them more than one choice, it's online. They go in, they can easily compare the plans, they can see who has their doctors in the network, they can look at formularies, everything is at their fingertips online, including your application, you put it online also. So let me talk about these employee choice models. Um, I actually love talking about them. Um, I shortened the presentation today only because I have a limited amount of time, but I'll tell you how you can hear the whole presentation on March 1st. Um, so the employee choice models, they're called one plan, one carrier, one level. As a small business offering health insurance through the Health Connector for Business, you can decide to offer one of these benefit models. Now, let me just describe them really quickly. One plan is not exclusive to the Health Connector for Business. It is the traditional way that small businesses have been um, offering health insurance. And that's where a decision maker in the business makes a decision for everyone. They choose what insurance carrier they're going to offer the employees. They choose what plan from the insurance carrier that they're going to offer the employees. And then the employees enroll in that plan or they don't because they have health insurance elsewhere. So there's not much of a variety. It's, um, everyone's kind of tailored into one plan. It is available on the Health Connector for Business, but again, it's not exclusive to us. It is available elsewhere. Exclusive to us is the one carrier and the one level. One carrier allows for the business owner to choose what insurance carrier they're going to offer their employees. Pick a plan from that insurance carrier that the business can currently afford to pay a contribution into. 
and then provide the employees the opportunity to choose a benefit plan from that carrier, outside the one that you offered, that fits your employees' needs. Some of your employees might need more care than others. In this case, someone who needs to go to the doctor a little bit more often might choose to pick a plan that has a higher premium but more coverage, meaning they pay less out of pocket on their service visits. And some might not, some might you know, want a higher deductible, and that's okay, they'll pay a lower premium. But what you do there is allow the employee to choose the benefit plan from that carrier that best suits their needs. One level is also exclusive to us, and this is a little similar, except in this case, you as a decision maker decide what kind of benefit plan you're gonna offer all your employees. So this really kind of controls their at service, time of service, um, deductibles, co-pays, and everything. But what you do is then look at all the carriers that are available at that level of benefit, and you choose the plan that the business can afford to pay into, the carrier that the business can afford to pay into at this moment. And then you offer this, and the employees can look across the insurance carriers and choose the plan that has their doctors in the network. That way, if you cannot put in to you know, maybe a very large network plan, you're not stopping your employees from seeing the doctors that they want to see. They will choose that insurance carrier that has their doctors in the network. And those are the employee choice models. Um, they, again, they are exclusive to the Health Connector for Business. Now, I talked to you and I said I'd tell you a little bit about some ways to get money back by promoting wellness in your business, and that's through our Connect Well program. So our Connect Well program is a wellness rebate program. It is designed for small businesses who offer health insurance on the Health Connector for Business and have 25 or fewer employees enrolled. The opportunity to get back up to 15% of what the business put into the health insurance premiums for the year. And the way to get this is for one third of your enrolled employees to participate in a wellness activity. We'd love 100% to participate in a wellness activity, but you only need one third during the year to participate upload online, everything's online, <laughs> and get approved that their activity was approved. And there's over 30 pre-approved wellness activities. One of the activities actually go to your doctor for your well visit. Very easy, doesn't cost the employee anything. They get a $100 Visa gift card, you get your one third towards your 15%. And just to let you know, this is real. Um, prior to when we all went remote, we did this you know, going across Massachusetts and delivering these big Connect Well um, checks. We provided the check to this um, owner of Clean Properties, Marcy Berger, she said the funniest quote, but we loved it. We heard that there would be a 15% rebate, and I said, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it, and here it is. <laughs> so she, you know, obviously we gave her the real check too, but, uh, she, and she could do what she wanted with that money. She didn't have to use it on health insurance, maybe she did, we're not sure, but she could use it for the business. There's also an opportunity to get money back through a small business health care tax credit. I don't talk much about this because I'm not an accountant or you know um, I don't do taxes, but the key to opening this conversation with your tax professional is I offered health insurance on the Health Connector for Business. If you offer health insurance elsewhere and you meet all of the other requirements, you couldn't even talk to your um, tax professional about this because this was created by the federal government for anyone who offers health insurance on the state marketplace. So what I always tell businesses, if you offer health insurance on the Health Connector for Business, you might not know if you're eligible here for this 50% tax credit, but it's an open opportunity for you to talk to your tax professional. So that's as deep as I get into it. <laughs> but there is an IRS website you can definitely go to and review it. So I also spoke about free certified assistance. On the Health Connector for Business, you can utilize a broker a local independent broker in your neighborhood. They might be your neighbor, they might be your friend, you might just know them, they might come into your business. They're free for you to utilize for any Health Connector for Business related item. They have access to an online portal, the same as you, they can actually access your account and they can put together easy cost estimates. Also, this is their subject matter expert area, so if you are focusing on your business and your business needs, allow them to take the time to focus on your benefits needs, and they'll bring everything back to you and provide you with what's best based on how you guys interview. 
So what I just presented to you was designed for small businesses with 50 or fewer full-time employees with at least one non-owner who needs access to health coverage. We also have health insurance for sole proprietors, entrepreneurs, partnerships, owner only, family run, anyone who doesn't have a non-owner enrolling in the health, um, in health and dental insurance. And that's our other platform, which you might be a little bit more familiar with, which is just Health Connector. Um, and so you might have heard the commercials recently, and you heard, oh, open enrollment, it ends on January 23rd. So if there's any sole proprietors in here, entrepreneurs, anything like that, you missed the open enrollment period, I want to let you know, don't think that's the end, you can't sign up. There are special enrollment periods now that we've passed January 23rd. And if you think that you might need access to health insurance and you've recently experienced a qualifying life event, still come to mahealthconnected.org and take a look and try the application. You might be eligible to enroll. And just to let you know, between the business one and the individual and family one, there's slightly a little bit of difference. Um, the mahealthconnected.org asks for some information. Uh, so for the Health Connector for Business, I said it doesn't matter where you live, where the employees live, right? But for the individual and family side, if you're a sole proprietor or an entrepreneur, you do have to be a Massachusetts resident to apply there. And, um, there's, and, you, don't, and you can't have health insurance elsewhere. So no accessible access to health insurance elsewhere. Um, and then there's a couple of things that they go through. I would assume most of these sole proprietors, small business owners who do not have any employees might most likely get the self-employment review, but you have to provide um, income for the individual side. Um, and just to let you know, if you've ever applied as a sole proprietor or an entrepreneur on the Health Connector and you're like, oh, I didn't get approved, don't let that stop you now because there has been some increased um, allowance in advanced premium tax credits that is beyond the 400 percentile that was there before. So if you've done it in the past, come back because of the Inflation Reduction Act, they did put in some expansion on there. So take a look. There's a free get a quote um, location at the bottom, get an estimate, plug in some numbers. It doesn't go anywhere. It's not an application. It's just an idea. Take a look and see if you're eligible for something. Now, I told you that small businesses with at least one non-owner have access to free help. So do entrepreneurs, sole proprietors, um, anyone who's an owner only, and they're called navigators and certified application counselors. And they're also free for you to utilize and assist and help you with the application, as well as our number. You can call at any time. So I always put this up to just make sure that everyone understood. The first part that I described was the health connector for business, and that's for any small business here in Massachusetts with at least one non-owner enrolling. I just want to let you know that as a small business, you do not have any open or closed enrollment period. If you decide on July 1st, you want to offer health insurance to your employees on July 1st, then just get everything done in the June deadlines. But as a sole proprietor, owner only, entrepreneur, no employees that do not have ownership, you do have to enroll during the open enrollment period that did just end or have a qualifying life event. But always just come to the website and try. See if you can get the health insurance. That's what we're here for. This is our website. You can definitely come to it. I also said I'd give a much longer presentation. We're going to have a big webinar on March 1st. I'll pass the information along to Chris so he can pass it along to all of you. And there I actually describe health insurance and I compare it to pizza. So it's kind of fun. Um, but yes, so, and just to let you know, there's some information on the tables. On your way out, if you want to grab anything to see if you're an eligible business, please do. And I will be around for any questions later. Thank you so much. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Jeffrey Fuhrer, Foundation Fellow at Eastern Bank Foundation. Jeffrey Fuhrer is a Foundation Fellow for the Eastern Bank. His work on racial equity is motivated by findings of the Federal Reserve's 2015 Color of Wealth in Boston study. He hopes to use his findings to design programs and policies 
close the wealth gap in the greater Boston metro area. Jeff was also a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He's conducting research on Federal Reserve's new monetary policy framework and sources of racial and ethnic wealth gaps. Jeff previously served as Executive Vice President and Senior Policy Advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. In 1992, he, in, in, rather in, in, in 2000, Fuhrer was named Senior Vice President and Monetary Policy Advisor. In 2001, he became Director of Research. And in 2006, he was named Executive Vice President. Fuhrer began his career with the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve System. He started there as a research assistant, and after earning his doctorate, returned in 1985 as a senior economist. He's been active in economic research for more than three decades, and has served as an associate editor for the American Economic Review. Fuhrer has published numerous scholarly papers on the interactions among monetary policy, inflation, consumer spending, and asset prices. He's been married for 35 years and has three grown children. Fuhrer earned an A.B. in economics with highest honors from Princeton University. He received his M.A. and Ph.D. in economics from Harvard University. Please welcome Jeff Fuhrer. Thank you. I, you didn't need to know all that stuff about research and whatever, but thank you very much for, for making the effort rich. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today at Stonehill. Some of you know that my boss, Bob Rivers, uh, has deep connections here at Stonehill. Um, I, this is actually the first time I've been on the campus and in this building, so and I hope it's not the last. It's great to see you all. I want to thank you guys for organizing. Um, for Catherine, who did a lot of the logistics behind the scenes. And I think there's, it, I don't hear today, but it was, was mentioned there's another Eastern Bank employee in the room. Is that true? Yay! <laughs> Shout out, there we go, for Eastern. A great organization to be affiliated with. They really take the notion of uh, being a community bank, giving back to the community, being integrated with the community, listening to the voice of the community so seriously. So let's see if this works. It's going to, it's going to work. It's going to work. Sure. I'm going to talk quickly. So maybe you could glean from my biography that I've done a couple of different things during my career. I've actually been married now for 42 years. That thing is out of date. <laughs> it's true. 42 years. Um, three, three grown kids. They're still three grown kids. <laughs> and I, I have a couple of grandkids too, um, which is just a, a joy. Um, I, I love when Rita said, you know, mother and then legislator, not because she's obviously completely serious about the legislative business, but bringing the humanity to your job, I think is so important, especially when you're really affecting other people's lives, so great to hear about that. Um, so I'm going to talk about the economy, because that was part of my job and still is, um, and I hope you'll be interested to hear about inflation and probability of recession and those sorts of things. Then I want to turn to a deeper and more complex topic. Um, which I'll get to in, in just a couple of minutes. So I'll, I'll talk briefly. But this is what the Fed, uh, this is what the economy looks like in a nutshell, if you will. So uh, we were growing slowly the first half of the year, we're growing a little better in the second half. Unemployment is still quite low. Uh, too many people unemployed, that's a good thing. Inflation, high, uncomfortably high, but coming down recently. Good, I'll come back to that in a second. And then Fed policy, they've been raising rates. You may have heard that, right? You may have experienced that. Uh, there's a reason for that, there are risks to that. I'll talk about that briefly. So this is to show you inflation, what's going on today, what was going on back in the 1970s and 80s. And if you were alive then, I was. And how many of you were? Yeah, yeah. Some of you. Some of you don't even, you know, wasn't a thing. <laughs> well, so inflation not as high as it was back then, but elevated. You can see we had a pretty tranquil period between those two red boxes and then it took off again. But the good news is it is coming back down. and. Um, this is the picture for New England, which looks fairly sing similar to the rest of the country. And then just to show you what's going on with the most recent data, um, just to show you that for the last three months, the last six months, the numbers are getting lower. Um, some of them are getting to be even 2% or, or below, which would be, we'd be completely, we used to be a Fed guy, we'd be completely happy with that, and I think you would too. It may take a little longer for it to get there on a consistent basis, but it does seem to be coming down, so that's great. Um, just to say that uh, 
Lots of people were wrong about what was going to happen with inflation. These are forecasts from professionals. So that means they do it. <laughs> Professional is kind of a strong term. But no, I mean, these are people who, for a living, forecast the economy. And it's showing you what they thought was going to happen uh, in the current quarter. So let's say the forecast was made in the second quarter of 2020. That's farthest over the left. They thought inflation was going to decline. Why? Because we were, the pandemic had just hit. So, you know, good bet. And then as they moved through it, they, they saw that inflation was going up. So they got the current quarter right. So they, this is what economists are best at, is forecasting the past. And um, because it's, it's, easy, I mean, it's easier than forecasting the future. Uh, and then this is what happened for the looking forward forecast of those things in the quarters. And they, they kept thinking it was going to come down in 2020 and 2021. But they were wrong about that. What we hope is the case is that now, the most recent forecast we had was made at the end of last year. Um, they think it's going to come down. This time they might be right. So um, I don't want to say it's like a stopped clock. Because, you know, give the same forecast, eventually it's going to be right. You get the time right once or twice a day, depending on whether you use military or uh, anyway. So uh, anyway, so that, they, they made mistakes. Uh, I didn't know inflation was going to be up this high. I thought it was going to go up because of the pandemic. I didn't think it would be this persistent, so I was wrong too. What we hope is the case is that it comes back down, and it seems to be doing that. An important part of that is whether inflation expectations remain stable and come back down. Uh, obviously, the more people think inflation is going to stay high, the more they're going to, if you're thinking about wages, the, more, the, the larger increase in wages they're going to demand, uh, and businesses may be forced to give. Uh, and that'll feed back into inflation some more. Inflation is expected to go down, a little bit less of that. So what are expectations doing? Well, here are 37 different inflation expectations measures, because we don't know which one to look at. But th this, these are the first ones I'm putting up are the near-term ones. What do people expect over the next year? And they went up, right? Like the forecasters, they could see that inflation was high, and they thought it would be high for a little bit, although those are starting to come back down as well. The next set that I'm flashing up here, these are the longer-term expectations, and they've stayed actually relatively stable, which means Generally, people believe this is a somewhat temporary phenomenon. It's going to be here now, but it's going to go away later. Okay, if so, that's good. And if they're right, it's even better. But at least for now, they're not expecting long-term increases, high inflation indefinitely. Because that happens, then they really start to expect consistently to see higher wage increases. Uh, prices will be going up more rapidly and for a longer period of time. So that doesn't seem to be happening. That's a good thing. Okay. That's inflation, right? So it happened, it's higher, it's coming down, it looks like it's coming down a good bit more. We'll see how that goes. What about recession? Because people are talking about that. Um, so, this, I'm just showing you on this chart some housing indicators. And they're all looking not so good, right? So existing home sales up on the top right there, they've come down a bunch. Uh, the building permits, you know, sort of a good indicator of where housing is going to be soon because in this state and, and almost all the others, we ask people to take out a permit before they build because we don't want the building to fall down immediately. I think that's a good thing. But it's, from an economist's point of view, it's a good indicator of future activity. It leads activity by a couple of months. But those are also down significantly. And then that red line is the median days until, until you get a, a sales. Basically, Zillow's way of saying, how long is the house on the market for? Well, they're, they're on the market for longer. I don't think this is a surprise to any of you because you've been reading the newspapers and some of you are involved in real estate. Of course, the part of the reason that's true is because as the Fed raised interest rates, the prevailing mortgage rates went up as well. That's what's going on in the bottom right chart there. Went up to 7% at one point. It's eased back from that, but still it's twice as high as it was about a year ago. Okay, so definitely housing is slowing down. What percentage of the economy do you think housing is? If you just, you know, how much of the activity that goes on in the economy has to do with housing? Construction, particularly, this, you can add in sales activity too. What do you think? Just throw out a guess: four percent, seventeen percent, eighty-two, twenty percent, right? And it's about it's about four. So, um, which is to say, it matters. It does matter. So that's sort of the real ones, the construction that occurs, as well as the brokers' incomes that are generated through sales and all that. It matters for sure, but it's not so huge that it drags the economy down all by itself. Is responding to interest rates. So, how about the rest of the economy? Well, so in terms of employment, we're actually still doing pretty good. This is, includes the monthly growth in jobs as of through December of this past year. It's the latest data we could possibly have on a monthly basis. Um, that's true nationally. It's also true at the regional level. Yes, not as fast as it was in the early parts of the recovery when it was growing so fast because it went down so far so fast. We've lost a huge amount of jobs 
in a few weeks uh, at the, in the teeth of the pandemic. Fortunately, within a few months, most of that came back because we were trying to figure out how to keep the economy going even through the pandemic. Um, okay, retail sales. So that's a little bit more of a concern just because it looks like some of consumer spending that's reflected in retail sales has been flagging over the last two months. But the good news is that GDP, which is, includes consum consumer expenditures and business investment expenditures and net exports and all that good stuff, uh, the data for that just came out yesterday for the last three months of last year, and we're still growing at about 3%, which is faster than we were growing before the pandemic. So as of the end of the year, overall activity, this includes the fact that housing slowed down, that's in GDP, and includes some slowing in certain parts of consumer spending. Altogether, the economy is doing okay. So point is, no recession at this, at, at this point. What happens next year is harder to say. Um, quick detour on Fed policy, just because I want to tell you, <laughs> having worked there, what, why they're doing what they're doing, and then you can yell about it if you like. But um, So prior to the pandemic, short-term interest rates that the Fed controls were close to 0%. It's hard to go much below 0% for a reason. I mean, yeah, you actually could do this in theory, but it gets really complicated. I'm not going to get into it. It has to do with like dollar bills, and they, you know, they pay 0%. Right? You don't get interest on a dollar bill, but if you do get 0%, you don't get minus 5%. So if, if we tried to push them much below 0 people would say, well, I'll take the cash thanks. That's a 0% return. looks much better. Right? So it puts a bit of a floor on that. You can tell, tell that at your next cocktail party. Yeah. Anybody know why it's hard, hard to get interest rates below zero? Just pull out a $10 bill and say, this is the reason. Um, if you're rich, you pull out a $20 bill. Um, anyway, so uh, they, the Fed obviously saw, started with zero rates. They saw that inflation was too high. And so they started raising interest rates. Because at zero, you're, you know, you're really actually stimulating the economy a lot. You're really propelling it. And, when inflation's high and we were close to full employment at that point, there's no particular reason for a monetary policy of interest rates to be spurring the economy beyond even faster. Okay, so what's going to happen in interest rates? So this is what they thought was going to happen in June of 2022. Yeah, 2022. Um, you know, they up around 3%. Then the next projection, well, they're going to go up to 4 Then the next projection, well, they're going over 5%. And... Uh, We'll see what happens in March of 2023 um, as, as they run through their meeting. The point is that they said they're going to raise interest rates. They're already at between four and a quarter and four and a half percent. And then at the most recent press conference, which was in December of this past year, the chair said more increases are likely coming. That's what he said. They have not really backed away from that, even in the most recent uh, speeches and so on. So I, I understand why they raised rates below from, from zero to something higher. That makes sense. The economy didn't need zero. The risk is how high should they go and what's going to be good for the economy. And at this point, I'd say we have two-sided risks. You could worry that inflation is not going to come down fast enough and they're going to have to raise rates some more. On the other hand, you could say it looks like inflation is coming down pretty well, more or less by itself, and uh, the Fed rate increases are going to slow the economy at a time when we don't need that. That's a risk. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but I think that's now a risk. Whereas before, you know, when they were 2%, you'd say, well, they're going to have to raise rates a little bit more. Now, it's, an, it's a two-sided risk question, I think. All right. So this is the bottom line on the economy. Uh, we, we've, I've talked about most of this already. Inflation looks like it's coming down. Employment's doing pretty well. There is a risk of recession this year. Some of it has to do with Fed policy. Some of it has to do with things beyond their control and our control. Um, I hope we don't see that. What I hope it, we see is inflation comes down, we keep employment strong, the economy keeps growing. That would be nice. Uh, okay, so that's a quick tour through the economy. And now I want to talk about something that's a lot more complex, and in many ways a lot more important. So, this is a book that I've written. So I'm, like, I'm giving a book tour now, it turns out. Right? It's just not what I've ever done for a living. I was a kind of a, like a geeky numbers guy um, in the back room calculating things, running models, doing econometrics, all this stuff. But what I'm doing now is talking about a bigger picture. And the title of the book is The Myth That Made Us. So what that, actually, sorry, that, that, that picture there is the cover of a book by uh, the famous uh, Horatio Alger. And it's, it's, what it says is, 
the title of the book is Strive and Succeed. I just put a question mark there because that sort of encapsulate, encapsulates what the book is about. Is it true in the U.S. today that if you strive, you will succeed? And the answer is not necessarily. And then and put more strongly, not often enough. Um, if you start off with terrific advantages, advantages of race, ethnicity, family wealth, uh, access to education, the, the town you grow up in, all those things. If you grow up with those, and you work hard, you have a pretty good chance of succeeding. If not, there's lots of barriers, and that's part of what I want to talk about. Um, so, the reason I call it the myth that made us is because, in my view, an important contributor to the lack of success, or the lack of uniformity of success in the U.S. economy, is the stories that we tell about how the economy works, and in particular, the stories we tell about why people are poor, white people of color on average have not succeeded as much as white people, that those stories are inaccurate and that they're corrosive and that they've been used to construct parts of the economy so that it keeps producing those outcomes, right? It keeps pr producing, it sends wealth and high incomes to not exclusively but disproportionately white folks who are already wealthy and, and have high incomes and denies those opportunities to pretty much everybody else. The stories matter uh, because, as I say, they've been used to dismiss the bad outcomes as unavoidable and they've also been used to keep constructing an economy that produces those. Um, this just defines what a narrative is. It's a story you tell that explains the way the world works, but usually with a particular point of view in mind. Right? And so I'll, tell you, I'll say what those narratives are in a second. I'll talk about what the outcomes look like this very briefly, very high level overview of what I'm talking about. Talk about the history of how that's been used to shape the system, but only at a very high level. Talk about the damage that has been inflicted, like in terms of dollars, and it's a lot of dollars. And then talk about how we get out of this, how do we fix it. Um, I want to be really clear, because I spoke about this at, at a couple of places, and some people said to me, um, you're being critical of the United States. You must hate this country. Uh, you, you, you don't believe uh, that, you don't believe in capitalism, you don't believe that hard works matters, and you're a bad person. <laughs> and that's what they said. So I, I want to be clear. Um, no, I'm actually quite fond of this country. I've lived here for 65 years. I, I don't choose to live anywhere else. I raised three kids, married three kids um, here. I taught them that responsibility and hard work are important. They are. But what I want to emphasize is that for so many people, they're, they're necessary to succeed, but they're not sufficient. Um, so anyway, I'm, you know, I'm, I hope what I'm doing here is, is not tearing down the country, not my intent, but trying to point out places where we can do better for more people. That's part of what I think is a proud tradition. Um, very quickly, some interesting features of the book. Uh, I, I am a, an economist by training. I'm used to presenting data, doing analysis, and all that stuff. But I, my feeling is that while that data and that analysis is, is an important underpinning for the book because it documents factually what's going on, the story of what's going on, when it's told by people who are living the experience of economic fragility, is much stronger. And so, as part of the book project, I interviewed a, a number of residents who live in the Commonwealth in low-end communities, not exclusively, but predominantly people of color, to let them tell their story um, to augment the data that I present and to put flesh on the bones of that, of that story. So I think that's an important addition to the book. The second is my editor said, the first time I drafted this, the editor said, you need to put more of you in the book, Jeff. And I said, that's not what I do. I mean, I've never you know, written something for a, an academic journal or for the public where I s emphasize Jeff, right? It's like, why would I do that? But there are good reasons to do that. One is to show my own ignorance about some of this going back some years, and I'm still ignorant of some things today. I'm still learning. But it's important to show that I learned, as we can all learn uh, together on this journey, it's important to show that the institution that I was associated with, which was a large public policy institution, also had some learning to do, and they're in the process of learning. So the Federal Reserve, There's, they didn't pay that much attention to this uh, until fairly recently, and now, you know, everyone, including the current chair of the Fed, um, 
are much more aware of the issues of institutional racism, its effects on the economy, on individuals in the economy, uh, where that came from, and, and what we need to do to deal with it today. The Fed doesn't have all the tools to take care of that, but being aware of and telling that story and making sure people understand it is important. Um, so anyway, those are some features. These are the narratives that matter. The first one is sort of the, what I'll call it the racial algebra narrative, which is that individual effort is sufficient to success, right? That's, anyone who works hard can succeed. Great story, not true, <laughs> right? Love to believe it, I'd love to be, believe it's true. It's a great aspiration, it is not true. But it is something that's deeply held by many, most of the people in the country. Um, there are people who are aware now that that's not quite true. There's a great quote from a billionaire uh, who said, you know, I realize that people say this all the time, all you have to do is work hard to get ahead. And he said, but I, actually I know that's not true. Um, and that's part of the reason he's giving away some part of his fortune. Good for him. Um, okay, so that's one piece of it. Uh, I, I just, as a side side thing, I point out in the book that Horatio Roger <coughs> didn't say what we thought he said. He didn't say that all you have to do is pick yourself up by your bootstraps and everything's going to be great. He didn't actually say that. There's lots of other things going on in his book, but um, in the preface to one of his books, which I'm just putting up here now, what he basically says is, the reason I write these books is to draw the attention, draw your attention to the plight of many hundreds of thousands in his day, millions and tens of millions today, poor kids who without the help from some of these aid societies, these sites aren't getting anywhere. So he's trying to draw attention to the problem and direct aid in that direction. Um, so that's one. A corollary to this Horatio Alger thing is that anyone who hasn't succeeded clearly is in that position because they haven't worked hard enough. Oh, that's a really bad inference to draw for all kinds of reasons. It's insulting for one thing. Um, it's inaccurate for another. And uh, combined with an another part of the narrative, which is that we're a post-racist or post-racial economy, uh, that has really bad implications for how people think about the way people of color um, do or do not succeed. Um, it, going with it is this a very deep-seated mistrust of the poor, which goes back to the founding of our republic and actually before that, uh, in Europe prior to the founding of the U.S. Republic. I have a quote from Josiah Quincy, who was in Massachusetts in charge of putting together a commission for what do we do about the poor in Massachusetts. And even back then, there was this notion of who are the deserving poor, who are the undeserving. Oh, you know, well, if you, if you, if you, if you have at least one out of four limbs, you should be working. Uh, I'm, I'm you know, joking, but I was just saying, unless you're severely disabled, you have no excuse for being poor and we don't deserve, you don't deserve any aid from us. That mistrust comes really I think, from the first narrative that people who are doing well will look at folks who are not doing well and say, well, why aren't they doing well like me? I mean, I, look, I work hard and everything's fine, right? It's like, well, maybe in the game of baseball, uh, you were born on third base, right? Uh, that's where you were born and somebody drove you home, um, not realizing that you got the first three bases as initial conditions from your luck of birth uh, is, is an omission. So, uh, there are other parts of the narrative that matter. Mm -hmm. This one is important for this audience and many others. Businesses are only responsible for maximizing profits or if you're a public, publicly traded business, satisfying shareholders and that's it. Because, you know, it, it, Milton Friedman actually started this. There's a great editorial he wrote in 1970 that says that if you don't do this, if you get distracted by other goals, it's tantamount, he said, to socialism. Uh, I'm not a socialist, by the way. That's not my bent. I think capitalism can work well if it's properly designed. We've chosen a flavor of capitalism that isn't working so well for so many people. But anyway, uh, he said socialism. So that, that, that view of what businesses are responsible for, I think, is, 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 accounts for a lot of the damage that's been done to people in the lower half of the income distribution in this country. Uh, not exclusively, but it is partly responsible for that. Uh, government, what's supposed to do? Stay out of the way. Let the free markets operate. So what's wrong with that? Well, I mean, you know, the legitimate debate is how much government should interfere with private activity. That's a legitimate debate. But there's no such thing as a free market. There is no such thing. Every single market that operates in this country was designed in a particular way to achieve particular goals and deliver benefits to particular sets of people. That's what markets are. They are designed. 
uh, and, and almost every case, and they're supported by the government in lots of ways. People call some of this corporate welfare, but it's not just that. It's that the designs, that the ways in which the government supports it, with infrastructure that supports them, and uh, all sorts of things, it means there's no such thing as a free market. So, to stay, there's a, so that's just a false paradigm. Um, so legitimate debate, yes, on what government should and shouldn't do, but saying free markets, no, there's no such thing. So government has to be involved for markets to operate. How they're involved is something we can talk about. Uh, but people use that narrative all the time to say, wait, government's interfering with free markets. It's like, well, <laughs> they're doing what they always do. They are a part of how markets operate. We can talk about whether it's good or bad, but that's something else. And then, you know, as important as anything else I talk about today is the, the role of racism or post-racist nation. God, I wish that were true. I really do. Uh, I look, I'm a white guy who's had all kinds of benefits, but I, you know, I have been on this learning journey for a couple of decades or something now, and it is just, to my mind, impossible to look at the history, the facts of how our country has run to whom it has given opportunity and from whom it has denied opportunity and say, yeah, that's, it's gone, it's behind us today, right? It just doesn't have any effect. And, and if you look, as we will in a moment, at the reflection that those decisions our country has made have had on wealth, right, that's accumulated um, by different families in the country, it's just unequivocal that the effects of those previous policies, the denial of opportunity, are completely alive today, to say nothing of the fact that still, for many folks in our country, as has been made evident in some of the protests and activities in the last five or ten years, still uh, personal racism is a problem, institutional racism is still somewhat embedded, and for sure the effects of previous institutional racism, racism uh, resonate today. So, those are parts of the narrative that I, I'm saying are false and have misled us badly. Um, we have all kinds of ways of getting past those narratives, but we first have to recognize that that's the way many people think about the world. Okay, uh, very quickly, I say that's an important narrative. Do I have evidence that it's held widely by people? Yes, I do. This chart says, yep, lots of people believe that effort, uh, hard work, is 92% say that's the main thing that determines economic mobility. Wow, that's, mm -hmm. that's a bold statement, right? Um, interestingly, it isn't, it isn't, that view is not that, that, broader view actually is held more or less equally across racial and ethnic groups. So that's interesting. Okay. Uh, we're also different from the rest of the world in the way we believe that. The U.S. is unique in lots of ways, but we are more likely to believe that it's laziness that leads to poverty than bad luck. Put it that way. 60% in the U.S. is, we're not the very top of the world because it turns out that Puerto Rico and Taiwan and the Philippines, a couple of those are, are, are tightly related to the U.S., but in any event, those are, are ahead of us in believing that laziness is the main explanation. Lots of other countries are less, much less likely to believe that, so we believe very strongly in this narrative. So, quickly, an alternative narrative is just, no, it's not the case that individual effort is sufficient, right? It just isn't. Uh, we are not post-racist, not yet. Maybe, maybe not in my lifetime, we'll see. This is just a quote from um, a woman who lives in Roxbury about her statement of the, the notion that we might be post-racist, which is, you can't believe that, and you can't believe that all you have to do is work hard. It just, she, she can't tell that in good faith to her kids because it's not true. Um, business maximizing profits. If we at the Fed spend a fair amount of time, and they still are studying the characteristics of low-wage jobs. What do they look like? Well, they look crappy. <laughs> That's what, what they look like. Um, not only low wages, poor access to benefits, unpredictability of schedules, you know, low, small worker voice that is little worker say in how things are conducted in the business. Um, that's a set of decisions we made that started back in the 1970s and 80s. I'll have to say, um, Jack Welch, who is sometimes revered as a leader at GE, does not come off well when you see what he did and how he helped to shape this. But he's certainly not the only person. Uh, as I said, there's no such thing as free markets. They require, most of them require some kind of oversight, regulation, and support. Um, maybe the critical insight here for all these structures is that we chose them. Not me, probably not you, but as a country, we chose this particular way of running our capitalist economy. I'm for, you know, again, loosely speaking, free market capitalist economies. I like that idea. 
but we chose a particular flavor of that that led to these sorts of structures and outcomes, led by a lot of these narratives. Um, how much brokenness has the, the set of narratives caused? So I'll give you a couple of indicators of that. So this is just, you know, people often look at the poverty level and say, well, there's too many people below the poverty level. What, do you know what the poverty level is for a family formed in the United States, as estimated by the Census Bureau for through 2022? Anybody got an idea how, how many dollars that is? 27,500, roughly. Family of four. 27,500. So if you're above that, you're okay, right? <laughs> so that, of course, right? That's the, you should get a laugh. That's crazy. You, yeah, if you don't eat or, or get to your work or have health care or take care of your kids or anything else, then, yeah, they might be able to survive that. Ridiculously low number. So this, what this is saying is if you look at, I picked three counties in the United States that are not high income. They're not San Francisco, Boston, New York, not even close. These are low to maybe middle income counties in the United States, what is the estimate of the cost to pay for the basics, you know, food, housing, transportation, health care, and so on? What is the cost estimated? Those are those green lines. So somewhere between 60 and in, in one county, even as high as 90,000. It seems high, but if you put your family budget together, you know it's not that high. Now compare the fraction of families in the country who have that level of income. And the answer is 40, 50, 60 percent or whatever of families in the US, in the US today don't have incomes as high as what's required to meet basic necessities. And the income measure I'm using there includes the government supports that those families get in terms of SNAP, uh, too many acronyms here, it's SNAP and TANF, um, housing assistance, all that, right? So even after, even after that, put that into the income, you don't have enough to get by. So that, this, in, in my, you know, when I look at this, I just think, how did we get here? How is it okay? that at least half of our families don't really have enough money to meet basic needs, let alone put aside something for saving, for retirement, for income security, for whatever. How did we get there? Okay, and then I mentioned earlier the wealth disparity. So these are staggering. Uh, so this is looking at white wealth, or the, the tall bars, and then either black African American wealth or uh, Hispanic Latino wealth in the smaller bars, and they're somewhere between 10 and 14 percent. That's the, the median. Uh, wealth, so much, much, much smaller. There's a, there is a famous study about the Boston metro area that showed it was 247,000 the median for a white family and eight dollars for a black family. I have to say as a disclaimer, we don't know if it was eight or plus 10,000 or minus 10,000. We don't know that. What we know is it's much, much, much smaller than white net worth. And that is, so um, Sandy Darity, Derek Hamilton would say that's that's a great reflection of the cumulative effect of discriminatory policies that denied wealth building over decades on families of color. It's a good way. It's, it's a snapshot. She says, look, over the years, through because of the lack of passing wealth on through families, this is what the discrepancies look like. Insane. Um, some of these things would be nice if we believe them to be temporary states of nature. That yeah, okay, so you don't have income now, but you're going to get more income later, right? Or you don't have wealth now, you're going to get more later. Well, that's okay, you know, it's sort of a life cycle thing. Unfortunately, that just does not happen. So that chart is just showing you that mobility, the odds that you are better off than your parents, or if you just look at people on their own, in their own household over 10 or 20 years, do they move from the lowest 20 percentile to the second lowest to the third lowest? The answer is not very often. And that's true for income and for wealth. So it's not a temporary state of affairs, it's a persistent state of affairs. Problem, right? Big problem. Okay. There's another quote from one of the interviewees. I don't have time. I don't have time to go through all the history, but I will talk a little bit about very, if you look at some of these things, there's a, there are a number of great books written about this, and I cite some of this in my book because I want to make sure everybody's seen it. But obviously, going back to the Civil War and before, of course, um, the, the litany of broken promises, denied opportunities is just staggering. There are some books that if you really want to be depressed, you should, you should be depressed. You should read them just so you know what the facts are. It's not by accident. This is by consistent legislation or implementation of legislation over decades, you know, at least starting from post-Civil War, right up until quite recently. And um, that, that, that history is just very briefly summarized here. Just a quick thing in the top table is just to say, well, oh my gosh, we spend so much on the safety net, right? Support for families. The safety net things are the things in the bottom of the table that account for a you know, small, single-digit percent of government outlays. 2%, 1%, we are not spending lots of money on that. 
Um, okay. So what's the way forward? The way forward is to provide opportunity more uniformly. Because if you have opportunity to build human capital, participate in the economy, obviously break down the systemic racial barriers as part of that, then not only you, but the whole economy benefits. This is like economic development in a sense. I think you have to think about this the way many people think about what are we doing with less developed economies around the world. We're trying to build it up so that uh, everyone there gets education, has access to training, um, good job experience. We have to do that in our own country, right? For everybody. Yes, some people get that. Lots don't. That's what it's like. And the, the beauty of that is that it's not a zero-sum game. It is not just about transferring income or assets from one group to another. It's about building up and increasing the size of the economic pie. And in that case, everybody benefits. Because when more people are educated, get decent, stable jobs that support their basic needs, their spending and the folks who already own businesses are benefiting from the increased spending, more jobs, more businesses. It's good for everybody. Um, it will take some time to get there. And I'm not saying there's no transfer of assets or income that would make sense. But it, it is a long run. It is not a zero-sum game. So these are some of the things that I would suggest we do. And they're not unique to me. There's great research behind all of them. Um, the first one I put down there is early childhood ed education, just because starting at the beginning of the kid's life, there's great data in the paper that shows that where you're born has a profound influence on whether you're successful in life 30 to 35 years later. That ought not to be the case. It just should be, right? As a sort of a moral principle, but it is a, it is a fact. Early childhood education that was universally available is expensive, but the returns are terrific. Um, I'll talk about the returns very briefly, and I'm almost done. Better use of community colleges, pipelines to stable employment. There are ways to do that. There are proven models. They are not widely applied, but they could be. They cost yes, they cost something. The returns there again are really great, meaning multiples of the cost. Terrific. Fixing crappy jobs. An agreement on what livable wages looks like. How do we get there? How do we not kill small businesses in the process of getting there? I have a proposal for that. Um, better schedules. There's a bill that's been lingering in Congress for several years now to make sure that unpredictable schedules is the norm. Got to fix that. Housing. Huge, right? Um, I heard Elizabeth Warren today on the radio, who I sometimes agree with, not always, but in any event, she has her heart in the right place generally, uh, say that 7 million housing units is what we need. It's actually more than that. But in any event, we are short housing. And the only way, one of the only ways to make that happen is to change zoning. There's a very local kind of a phenomenon, but there are federal levers. So, for example, a trillion dollars each year is granted to states for economic development purposes. If some of that money, so let's say 10% of it, $100 billion annually, was used to provide incentive that you don't get that money unless you make progress on changing the zoning laws so that we can build the housing stock that we need, there's a lever. And that could be done. It takes some political will. But anyway, affordable housing, it's just huge. You can't, you can't live. You don't, have a base, you don't have a foundation, literally, unless you uh, have safe, affordable housing. Whether everybody has to own or rent is another question. I mean, ownership can be a, a means to build wealth. It isn't always. Um, and you have to be careful about how you do that. But in any event, housing, critical. And then finally, uh, in terms of the really substantive ones, I'm putting it up here because I think it's, it, we have to grapple with this. So baby bonds, we can put a deposit in each child's account based on their household income and wealth, which means some poor white folks will get it too. That's fine if they're poor and they've been screwed by the economic structure, they deserve it, but of course it will go disproportionately to people of color. And then reparations, which people said, I had somebody say, say to me at a talk uh, six months, nine months ago, said, well, you shouldn't use the word reparations because some people don't like it. And I said, good. That means it's important. We need to talk about it. We need to start socializing the idea. Is it easy? No. Um, when you estimate the, the value of missing wealth due to government policies, $15 trillion for African Americans, roughly equal size for Latinos and Hispanics, um, just a trillion for Native people, although that doesn't include the land we took from them, <laughs> then it gets to be a much bigger number. But uh, that's another story. So huge numbers, and yet 
as a nation, we are responsible for creating that outcome. So we, I feel we have a moral responsibility to do something about that. Yes, it's hard. Yes, some people don't like it. Why am I paying for this? Because you benefited from the policies that it helped your family get where you are today. If you're really poor, if your family never had economic success and wealth, okay, fine. That's not your responsibility. But it is for the, for the rest of us. So anyway, I put it up there because I know it is emotionally charged. I know there are people who don't like it, and that's one of the main reasons I want to talk about it, so that people start to take it seriously. There are public opinion polls that say, just 20 years ago, only 4% of the population supported anything like reparations. Today, that number is getting closer to 30. So it's not the majority, but it's going up. And it's partly because people don't understand it, don't understand the history and why it's so important we do something. So that's, that's it, I'm just, I'm just saying. So here, the, on the left-hand side are the losses annually to the, the brokenness of our current economic system. 14 to 17 trillion dollars per year. That adds up over time. Uh, the cost of the programs I put in there is around two trillion dollars per year. Is that a lot? Yes, it is. But some of the returns on these programs, I want to show this quickly. Early child education, if you gave everyone who needs it and doesn't have access, let's say for round numbers, half of the families, early childhood would cost $212 billion a year. That's a lot of money. What it generates in terms of returns, so better incomes, more stable health outcomes, all of that, $1.2 trillion a year, roughly speaking. That's a pretty good return. Boy, if you had that investment to make as a private businessman, you'd be all over that. <laughs> Terrific investment. Research proof. This is not a guess. There's great research to support those kinds of returns, and they're probably an understatement. Community college investment, $25 billion if you invest in community colleges. The return in terms of wages over one uh, uh, those folks' lifetime would be $250 billion, so 10 to 1 increase relative to the investment. Is that a good oh, That's a really good investment. It's true for other things, too. Um, so, just to say, in so my view, the way our economy works right now just cannot be right for so many people. It is not right with a capital R, right? It, it's, it's wrong with a capital R. Okay? It is wrong. How do we fix it? We change the narrative. We invest in opportunity to, to, give, to, give, pardon me, to give people equal opportunity to build human capital. And the bottom line on this is that we broke this, but we can fix it. We broke it. We chose to break it in this particular way. But there is hope. We can fix it because it's about changing the way the economy provides opportunity to everybody. Okay. Plenty of Services and the Rotary Club of Rockland. If you look at that table in the corner, those are, those are all uh, Rotarians there. <laughs> I'm one of them. Yeah. Next is Save the Dates. Okay, February 10th, ribbon cutting, grand opening at Reese's Marvelous Hats, 4 to 5 p.m. in Stoke. Thursday, March 7th, the 8th Annual Multicultural and Business Forum at Thorny Lee. Uh, goes from 5 o'clock through 7.30. Sponsored by Northeast Savings Bank. Okay. Now it's time for the door prizes. Okay. Each edition of this Metro Self Good Day, uh, we randomly select one company to be highlighted in an upcoming action report. And the winner is Claudia Denville. Welcome with Claudia. <laughs> Door prize number two was an Amex gift card. And the winner is Maria Sola, Brockton Neighborhood Health Center. 